Welcome to Beyond Coding, a dive into the world of successful people in IT. From your sponsors, Zebia, creating digital leaders. Here's your host, Patrick Akil. Hey guys, welcome back to the session. So for this session, we're going to do a live episode recording of the Beyond Coding podcast. That's why we kind of have our podcast set up with double microphones and headphones and all that shebang. So uh, I have two guests today. On my right, probably your left, is Roman Ivanov. Uh, and on my left, probably your right, is Julian Derauter. Uh, my guys for the show. So uh, so let's kick it off then. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank How's you. it going? Yeah, fine. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah, I, I still don't know if I like this setup because <laughs> I'm looking left and right so <laughs> to see either of you. Uh, but I invited you on to talk about MLOps, right? Yes. And uh, you guys are very passionate about that. So let me, let me first start off with Julian. Why, why are you passionate about MLOps? In the first place, um, so in my work at Go to the Driven, mm. uh, we've well, so we have spent a lot of time with clients trying to help them build cool machine learning models, right? Yeah. Uh, but then also trying to get them a little bit further, so not just uh, like this proof of concept, but something that can actually run somewhere with you, so in production. Yeah, um, and we see that's always a very difficult step to make. So making the proof of concept is easy, but actually pushing it somewhere it's used is hard. Um, and uh, yeah, so a lot of my work centers, centers around trying to make this uh, process easier for data scientists and also for the team surrounding it so that we can make it smoother uh, and try to do this as quickly as possible. Yeah. Uh, so basically, it's my, my day-to-day work, I guess. Nice. Uh, and also, I think, uh, a, a challenging process. So there are a lot of different things to keep, to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I like the challenge, I guess, <laughs> as well. Yeah. I think, the, I think because it's that challenging, it's more rewarding when it actually does go live. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And also, yeah. So maybe I won't, don't want to take up all the time, but uh, <laughs> I also enjoy like the. It also touches typically on different disciplines as well. So not just like uh, only software engineering or only data science. And I like uh, so my background is also a bit in the life sciences and computer sciences. And I always enjoyed being in the uh, so like on in the, between the boundaries of these uh, different subjects. So yeah. that's also one thing I really like uh, the cross disciplinary angle to it as well. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Cool, Roman. What about you? Yeah, so. I'm coming from the software engineering background, mm. and it feels to me that machine learning engineering is experiencing the same kind of um, history as the software, software, software engineering. It's because um, at the earliest days of the software engineering, a lot of questions were raised, how to standardize software engineering, how to make it properly, um, how to uh, make sure that the quality is there. And uh, there are a lot of ideas were discovered, implemented, and they've proven to be correct. I'm just gonna put that mic. Yeah, a bit closer to yeah you. thanks. <laughs> yeah, uh, so a lot of ideas were proven to be uh, correct, and now software engineering is a pretty much standardized field. And yeah. uh, um, you can expect uh, uh, things like unit testing, uh, CI/CD, and uh, um, yeah, good good documentation, and all these uh, principles already implemented in software engineering, and 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 a regular process is expecting it to be in place. Mm. And I think that in uh, machine learning engineering, we are uh, on the early stage of standardizing this process. And because um, I have more than 10 years of software engineering background, I kind of uh, see that I can contribute quite a lot to standardizing ML engineering. Yeah. And uh, uh, recent, uh, uh, recent adoption of the MLOps uh, uh, philosophy uh, is actually uh, yeah, uh, re-implementing or implementing the standardization process of the software engineering in specifically in the ML field. Okay. And uh, I really like this journey because uh, it's a lot of in common with with what I have already experienced, but uh, uh, a lot of different uh, topics that are specific to the scientific process. And uh, uh, yeah, as Julian mentioned, it's a uh, multidisciplinary field and i like the fact that it's a new uh, in terms of uh, it was never before standardized and uh, you can apply your skills to yeah do something uh, new and uh, help uh, help people to to get their job to production yeah man i uh, i love hearing that as kind of a software engineer myself it sounds like software engineering but with a, di- a bit more science background and, and kind of in a different jacket in that way as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. yes. But if I, if I were to ask you, what is MLOps? How, how would you kind of define that? So first of all, is a principle. Hmm. Is a principle and it's a discipline. You can say also that it's a philosophy. Yeah. And this is the attitude of how you do the machine learning engineering. 
Of course, you can uh, just uh, hack uh, the model in the notebook and uh, maybe you will get some uh, good results. Mm. But uh, probably on the real production environment, that will not uh, be uh, the preferred solution. And what will be the preferred solution is to standardize the process so that it uh, takes the data uh, consistently, it um, trains the model regularly, it deploys uh, the model to production, and then it verifies that this model behaves correctly mm. according to the expectations in production. So there is a full feedback loop, yeah. and according to the feedback loop, you know how to react on every stage and what to do next. So I think MLOps is the discipline that standardizes this um, feedback loop. Okay, so you start with a, a machine learning model even yes. though we'll, we'll get into what that is in a, in a second, but it's the whole operation of getting it into production. Yes. And then with that feedback looping included, because yeah. then you can still adjust if it's if it's right or, or not right. Exactly. Cool, man, I love it. Kind of kind of getting a mental picture now of, uh, of what I see. Julian, on, on your end, can you explain to us what a machine learning model is in the first place? Um, that's maybe a good question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, a machine learning model, uh, a lot of people call it uh, like, the next stage in software, right? Yeah. Where uh, essentially, um, no, in more traditional kind of software development, we uh, build software to, to follow, to basically implement the rules that we have, uh, have in mind for a certain process. Yeah, yeah I, th I thought that. <laughs> um, and with the machine learning model, it's it's a bit more vague because essentially we want to teach uh, a piece of software to, to have some kind of uh, behaviors if we give it a certain input to give us some kind of uh, output. Uh, but this is uh, less well-defined than with like rules that you would have in software engineering okay. in, in, in traditional software. So um, essentially we're trying to teach, them, teach a piece of software something that we don't quite understand ourselves. Yeah. Uh, to take, uh, for example... Um, yeah, so to take, for example, if you go to a website, uh, like the, the recommender kind of approach where or yeah. like Spotify, for example, uh, to basically teach a model to recognize what kind of music you like from the things that you listen to and to uh, then um, basically recommend uh, new music to you that you might like to listen to. Yeah. Um, and we could do this saying, well, you like, uh, for example, we know like you like heavy metal. Uh, yeah. So uh, we we'll just recommend everything that's heavy metal. But I think it's a lot more fluid than that. And that's why, uh, well, we're trying to essentially... Uh, teach software to take all the data we have on the, on you, for example, and your uh, and on other users of what kind of music you like, yeah. and then condense that into this kind of predictive model, which will then uh, somehow give us an idea of what you like. Uh, yeah, it, it still feels like a bit of magic to me, but I could, I could kind of guess how if I pick a specific certain set of music and you do the same and someone else does the same, based on that, you could kind of define what you would recommend to someone who has the same history. Yeah. 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 So in the end, it's just trying to look, so the all these algorithms are trying to look for patterns somewhere yeah. in the data that are not directly visible to us, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and try to extrapolate from that uh, to, in this case, give predictions for uh, for you in that case. Exactly. So then, before before MLOps was a thing, so to actually standardize that operational process and, and getting it into production, who makes the models in the first place? Like, who's kind of responsible for that? Yeah. So typically, that would be the role of a data scientist. Yeah. Uh, who then? Um, yeah, basically, uh, does the take well does the whole exploration of the data to get an idea of what the data get a feeling for what kind of data we have, what kind of patterns are in there, yeah. um, and then uh, based on uh, interesting features they find, um, then uh, try to come up with a well with a predictive model in this case. Um, so both in terms of features and the model itself, yeah, because you have different machining algorithms, of course. Um, and then try to turn that into uh, something that you can then give, for example, your music history, and then it will give like uh, predictions of what you would like in the future. Exactly. Um, so that would typically be a, a data science role. Yeah. Um, and that's maybe also one of the difficult things that Roman alluded to a little bit is that uh, this is traditionally done then by a data scientist. Yeah. Uh, but they don't necessarily have like a formal software engineering background. Some do, some don't. Um, and that's why uh, making then the step to to like a more production environment is a bit more difficult because A, it doesn't fit entirely in the software, yeah. like the traditional software engineering paradigm, but B, also because people have different backgrounds and don't necessarily have like all these uh, skills already in place. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So the engineering side is, is well, how, how much do you need to know as an engineer for the actual model to operate in production? Like, do you need to know what it does necessarily or just how to get it in place in the first place? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so I think... Uh, like Roman said, if you standardize a lot, yeah. um, then in principle, I could teach, like take a model from data scientist, assume uh, t as a black box, and yeah. then as long as it 
has a certain interface, I can put it somewhere in production. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if that's necessarily the best approach. So I think it's I, I think uh, I think it's good to like Roman said to have some standardization so that we yeah. have uh, some agreements on what the model looks like, so that we can fit it into our infrastructure, we make sure it's secure and performant and all these kind of things. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I do think um, taking one of the DevOps principles uh, of like ownership. Yeah. I think uh, it's. In general, we should have like cross-disciplinary teams with different roles. So that should be a data scientist, uh, someone with an engineering background, so a machining engineer or a data engineer maybe. Yeah. Um, and that this team is basically responsible for the model, uh, yeah. not just from the inception, but like also uh, for the whole life cycle. So taking it from inception to production to uh, and improving the model, maintaining it, and things like that. Yeah. Um, and I, that's what I also like about Roman calling envelopes a philosophy and mm. not just uh, because pe people jump to tooling very quickly to yeah. say, oh, we have all these fancy tools, let's use them. <laughs> but I think the, the the principles of the philosophy is stronger where you need to make sure that you have the right roles in your team to also be able to embody this process as well. Yeah, that makes sense. To me, it sounds a lot like product development already that's in place without kind of the data science component of it, right? Without the machine learning model. Yeah. If you have an idea, kind of test it with your users, get back that feedback yeah. uh, and reiterate new version, etc. Yeah, it's kind of the same, except with a machine learning model. And I like that you say you could treat it as a black box, might not be the most effective way, but it is an option uh, and still kind of go through the same principles as you would developing a, a regular product with yeah. a non data aspect, basically. Yeah. yeah. And then you have the extra challenges of taking along. So you have to get the data from somewhere. You have yeah. to make sure that's good quality uh, and you have the whole uh, added dimension of my machine model is part software, part data it was trained yeah. on. So it's not just, the software might not change, but I can still have, I still have data uh, coming in, which when I retrain the model might give it different behavior. Yeah. Uh, so that's also something you need to monitor and to keep in mind uh, um, how that performs over time, uh, as well as like the, well, maybe there's a different subject, but <laughs> like the, like the, the ethical uh, implications of what your model might predict uh, if you're predicting things for for people, for example. What what do you mean by that? The ethical kind of aspect. Um, well, so one so one example that jumps into mind is, uh, for example, these um, like these image recognition problems, where mm. uh, basically uh, you have machine learning models which can take an image and try to point out all the different models uh, in the uh, sorry, all the different objects in the picture. Yeah. Um, and there, if your data set is biased, for example, it might be very good at uh, recognizing, for example, white people. Yeah. Uh, but if it hasn't been, uh, if it hasn't been trained uh, on people with different skin colors, it might not recognize them, or it might recognize them differently. Yeah. Um, and these are all kinds of uh, ethical implications that you need to keep in mind for your model. Yeah. As well as, for example, a model I think uh, was a, was a chatbot of some sort. All right. um, I forgot the name, but I think uh, I think it was from a team at Microsoft, mm. and there they also had uh, people actively feeding the, the, the machining model in this case, uh, maybe not so nice examples, so that it turned, I think it turned into a pretty racist bot overnight. Oh, really? So also these things are also maybe things that you need to keep in mind. Uh, yeah. It's a more a living thing than a static piece of software, uh, essentially. Yeah, I mean, you start with a blank slate and based on what kind of data you feed it, it'll kind of train itself to adhere to that data. Yeah. And kind of reflect that as well. Yeah. And so, like sense. Roman also said, I think yesterday in our uh, in our session on TFX, you also said garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. So basically, what you feed into your model has a big implication for how it will behave, uh, and whether that's a desirable behavior, that's something that you need to take into account. Yeah. Man, that's difficult. That's difficult. Roman, back to you. Um, we already mentioned kind of the the garbage in, garbage out. Yes. But when are organizations kind of ready to do this? Right. Yeah. Already the data needs to be in place. You need a lot of things, I think, as organizations to, to get yeah. this up and running. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, the organization that is bringing a ML solution to production, as Julian mentioned, is ethically responsible for keeping it uh, consistent and not harming. Yeah. And uh, to do that, uh, you need to have processes in place that uh, verify the data, drifts, um, concept drifts, and things like uh, if you're live data is changed over time mm. because uh, something is changing in the reality. Do you need to address this in your model or you need to say that the data is not correct according to your expectations? Yeah. So you have to do these uh, decisions all the time. This is the monitoring of the production model that uh, yeah, the team who is uh, bringing the model to production is responsible to make these decisions. If the data is uh, drifting towards some bias, mm. as Julian mentioned, uh, for example, skin colors or I don't know, um, 
all sorts of other um, uh, biases, you have to uh, react on that. Accept the fact that it is now a norm yeah. or fight the bias. So that's the responsibility on the ethical side of the product team. And if you see maybe that uh, the data um, changes, so you were expect expecting the um, data to look like, uh, you know, in certain ranges, but uh, now uh, more you see the data in different ranges, maybe the world has changed and yeah. you need to adopt the model. So you need to accept the new reality. And uh, that's, yeah, that's the process of uh, um, monitoring the life of the, um, of the productionized model. Yeah. And it has to be incorporated uh, in the process. So every time you see any drift, hmm. there should be a feedback loop saying like, hey, this is, uh, this is an outlier. This is going, uh, this is drifting now. We need to do something with that. And the do something with that is always uh, a scientist or a product team who uh, have to look at it, yeah. understand the nature of the outlier and react on that accordingly. So, yeah. Is that a, is that a manual process? So kind of, I'm going to try and kind of explain my thoughts on what you just mentioned, but you have a model, right? And there's kind of a dashboard somewhere in, in the data that you're kind of newly retrieving. I think it's new data then, right? Yeah. And like, you should have kind of an overview of outliers, right? Based on the history that you fed the model and the new data that comes in, you can kind of see what data is an outlier, yes or no. Yeah. And is it then a manual process to be like, oh, these outliers are now new reality? So for example, if you have done some research mm. and you say, okay, uh, we're expecting, expecting the data to be in some normal distribution with uh, uh, this uh, center like yeah. a, uh, like a bell curve yeah. yeah and then you said these are the outliers at the moment yeah and uh, anything that um, is an outlier can be detected can be uh, informed in the form of the dashboard or whatever the feedback loop is yeah and uh, yeah maybe the outliers could be just uh, rejected they could be not um, processed or processed in a separate way but also if you see that over time uh, the data is uh, drifting towards a new norm mm. so your original research doesn't fit the reality anymore yeah. you have to change the behavior of the model yeah so yeah i mean it's uh, it's a constant constant process of um, making sure that your model your mathematical model yeah. if you wish uh, actually corresponds to the reality mm. because that's like a, a mathematical method right so you invent a model you think this model fits the reality yeah and then you always make sure that it still corresponds to the always changing reality yeah yeah so and uh, mlops is is the is the process that helps to standardize it specifically in the software domain yeah is it something you can already kind of initially put in place let's say i i like the the recommendation model that you laid out julian in kind of the i think it's most uh, recognizable for a lot of people. Uh, but let's say I, I start out with an idea, right? I'm, I'm just newly uh, forming a startup. I want to build kind of a recommendation tool on, on some aspects. How do I start? Because I have this idea, I have a concept. Uh, I think I need to start collecting data as maybe kind of the first step. Uh, but what will be that next step? Let's say I yeah. have a bunch of data. Can I already kind of create a model towards that? Yes. So you can create a model and you always uh, can create a schema. Hmm. A schema that will be the description of uh, how do you expect the data should look like. Yeah. And then if you see that uh, in reality the data comes differently, uh, the default behavior probably will be to uh, set an alarm. This is an outlier yeah. according to the schema because the schema is not just uh, uh, types, etc. It's also the um, definition of uh, expectations. Okay. So how do you expect a specific uh, feature to look like in which proportions, in which uh, values, categorical uh, uh, lists and maybe uh, boundaries of some numerical uh, fields. Yeah. yeah. So you, you define the expectations and if it the data that is coming from the real world is not meeting the expectations. Yeah. By default, you say that it's an outlier. Th okay. This is this is this is the beginning of, of the journey, right? So if you're a startup, you're building the model from scratch. Yeah. On your research process, define your expectations, and then based on these expectations, your model will be reacting on the on on the expected data. Yeah. Uh, if you don't put these boundaries with schema, there is always 
this threat of dealing with something that you're not supposed to be dealing with. Yeah. And then, as we mentioned, it's uh, garbage in, garbage out, right? Yeah. So if the model is not trained to deal with this data, it will predict some random results. And who needs these random results? You don't, de- you don't need this because you don't know if it's available, if it's consistent, and uh, if you can actually rely on it. Yeah, so if you keep feeding it the outliers, it's not going to predict back to the norm, basically. Yeah, exactly. If the recommender system was trained to target the uh, teenagers, for example, yeah. and then immediately it uh, starts to uh, get more uh, data from uh, a more adult population, mm-hmm. and uh, it's, it's not correct to recommend the same uh, content for adults because probably they have uh, different preferences. Yeah. And you don't know if, if, you, if the model wasn't trained on these preferences, so it would be kind of like really random. Yeah. You, you don't want that. Interesting. So I would have a model and I would have a schema, which would basically be my normalized set of data. Yeah. Right. And that kind of defines where my outliers are. Exactly. And based on kind of identifying those outliers, I can see if I need to incorporate these. Uh, but that's a manual thing, right? You, you would look through them. Yeah, so first, uh, on the research process, Mm. you say, my model is targeted for a teenage audience, for example. And I set the boundary. So every time I get um, the input data, I expect the uh, feature age to be in, like, I don't know, 15 to 17, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, boundaries. Yeah. And if I get, uh, like, 45, probably the model is not supposed to deal with this audience. And I don't want to do anything with that. I would yeah. say like the data should not go here. Maybe there is another model that is specifically trained for, for this audience and yeah. I better route it uh, over there. And the feedback loop is that maybe uh, the routing of the data is incorrect, right? So mm. it should not land on this model. Yeah. So yeah, that's how it's Interesting. I'm, I'm wondering based on kind of this, I'm, I'm going to go back to you, Julian. Um, based on this kind of setup, at some point you're running, right? And you have kind of the, your model and your schema and you can uh, identify outliers and kind of incorporate them or not. But when is, when is my recommendation thing that I'm building, when is it done? Is it ever done? It's never going to be done, is it? Uh, yeah, I guess it depends on uh, what your definition of done is yeah. in that uh, respect. So I think uh, maybe jumping back to the previous question for a second. Yeah. So what I think is uh, interesting is that Roman dives straight into the engineering mindset mm. of uh, how do we make like the whole uh, thing dependable with uh, good data quality and things like that. Yeah. I think for a startup, what you would maybe also typically see is that people jump straight into, oh, we have a bunch of data. Uh, let's train the model. Uh, let's see how we can get that somehow serving predictions. And yeah. then uh, worry later about getting all these things into place to make things a bit more dependable. Yeah. Um, and I guess it's, all, it's also a bit of a valid point, right? If you don't have anything, uh, it's not a lot of risk, then you might, uh, so it's like more of an interesting proof of concept that you don't have a lot of risk on it as a company. Yeah, um, you can test better. You, you can do it a bit more ad hoc. Yeah. Um, and then later you make this process a bit more refined. Uh, but I think uh, one powerful thing of like the whole MLOps uh, concept is to also have a, um, try to have good defaults in place. Mm. So that's also like the TFX talk we gave yesterday. That's an, an example of that, yeah. where you have a basically an opinionated setup, which which components should be in place uh, for, for data quality, uh, but also for uh, for deploying your model, for monitoring predictions over time. Yeah. Um, maybe some things from a security aspect as well. So that you, uh, if you already have this template kind of in place, um, that people have like a good default place to start from. It's fairly easy to try, start training a model, but you get all these good behaviors kind of from the get-go. Yeah. Um, and I think part of this is process and part of it is technology, which you'll see like the cloud vendors nowadays also jumping in on and all kind of open source tooling like Kubeflow yeah. uh, to kind of give you all these different uh, components to set up this process. Uh, yeah. Um, but also, yeah, so to, to kind of get these good behaviors from the software engineering standpoint uh, available by default and also hopefully accessible for data scientists as well. Yeah, that makes sense. You don't want to reinvent the wheel on this whole process in, in kind of incorporating your product or your idea uh, to production in a way. Yeah. It's easy to hook into hopefully existing infrastructure in that way. Yeah. Uh, or existing tools that you can kind of feed off of. Yeah. Yeah. That's also what we're trying to do at uh, Go Data Driven. So yeah. we have quite a lot of experience at customers where we've implemented a machine learning model uh, yeah. and also uh, moved this into production settings across all kind of different clouds as well. Yeah. Um, but so there we're also trying to standardize basically like the platform that we're using for things like that and also the way of working on top of that. So that basically when we go to a client, we can very easily say, oh, you're working on Azure. Well, we think this approach lo- uh, works very well on Azure yeah. uh, using these different components from the cloud platform with this kind of way of working. Uh, so that is also cl- kind of clear 
like what the process is through that technology as well, kind of like the uh, golden path idea as Spotify calls it as well. Yeah. Um, I think that's a, a powerful combination to have as well. So not just, so a, like an opinionated setup of technology, but also opinionated how to use it. Um, yeah. Because yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of tooling out there. Uh, exactly. And I think people often get lost in uh, what should I be doing? How should I be doing it? And what to like, also depending on your maturity level, right? It's a company. Uh, um, if, yeah, if you're a big corporate with like, a, or you have a, maybe like a, a lot of different teams working with different data, then you might want to have something like a feature store where you can share data easily across teams yeah. um, and a data mesh kind of setup. For a startup, it doesn't make sense to put a lot of effort into setting all these things up if you're still focusing, if you're still in the one team of focusing on your initial, uh, your initial products, I'd say. Exactly. So. It's going to be a, a kind of a combination of quality versus robustness in, in that way, or maybe yeah. quality robustness is not the best example. But maybe speed, right? If you're a startup, you want to kind of work on an idea, a concept, and get it to a user as fast as possible. Yeah. So you, you're going to kind of compromise on quality and, and robustness initially. Yeah. yeah. I think coming back now, I'm remembering your, your original question. So yeah. when is a model done? Yeah. Uh, so I think it depends on so what you expect, like I said. Uh, but I think it's good from the from the beginning to have like some guardrails in place where you say, uh, so also take like the ethical situations we discussed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, especially if you're predicting things uh, yeah, for, for people uh, that you have, uh, well, if you have some uh, guidelines, like there shouldn't be a gender bias in there or things like that, you, that you have controls in place to make sure that these, that uh, this isn't an issue. Yeah. Um, and otherwise, uh, so like from a product standpoint, then, it, then I think it's an iterative approach. So you have uh, metrics, which you can use to yeah. see how well your model was predicting uh, yeah. what you expect it to be predicting also maybe from like the mathematical standpoint, but also from like the business standpoint. So it does the, is it really adding value for our, our customers? Yeah. And then it's an iterative approach to keep on, uh, yeah, keep on improving the model uh, to make sure, uh, yeah, to make sure it gives better recommendations, for example, in the case of music. Exactly. But then somehow you need to balance in, in kind of the extra effort in, in re-educating or more educating the model versus the value it's going to bring you. Yeah. Right? Is it sometimes, sometimes I don't think it's going to be that different, right? And getting it a bit better versus the value for the customer? Or am I wrong there? What do you mean exactly? I mean, at some point, you're going to be happy with kind of the, the quality of the recommendations, right? But you can keep iterating, and you keep, can keep making it better. But is that going to impact the customer better than initially? Um, I think it's hard to balance that. Yeah, I think that's something that you would have to answer from the business side of things. Uh, yeah. Like you said, for recommendations, at some point, it might be good enough. Uh, yeah. Or you want to might tr yeah, try a different niche, for example, that you uh, try a different approach for recommending stuff. Yeah. Um, I think if you're looking, for example, at uh, <coughs> recommenders for uh, selling products, for example, so yeah. ad advertisements, essentially, I think they're like even very small differences add up to like a big amount of uh, a big amount of sales. Uh, oh, for, really? For for big yeah for 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 online platforms. So, yeah. So there. Uh, at least I've seen talks where they talk about like a zero point something percent difference, but apparently that was like uh, millions of uh, euros in sales. So, oh, that's uh, crazy. So it can still be pretty crazy uh, f f on that kind of scale. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. That's it. So you've, you've been in a lot of different organizations and a lot of different settings. Um, what, what's kind of the, the interesting thing you've seen in, in kind of our, our organizations ready when they think they are? <clears throat> and what usually goes right or wrong within that process in getting that machine learning model to production? Um, so at least the companies I've been in the past, um, often like the experimentation side we talked about, so yeah. data scientists being able to, to make a model, I think that often worked pretty well. Mm. If uh, so, they had a team internally being able to train different models. Yeah. Um, the big problem I've always seen is like uh, the step after that. So we have a model. How do we get it into production? And then I've also seen. Um, yeah, so one of the traditional problems, for example, is that we have the data science team who, who likes doing models yeah. and we have like IT, traditional IT or something on the other side or an engineering team and yeah. they don't necessarily mix very well. Um, so then basically they try to give their model over to, to the IT team. They don't necessarily understand what the model is or what it does. And that's exactly. why it sometimes takes like two years to go from concept to like a production like setting. Yeah. And I think that's like the biggest challenge I see in general that uh, uh, and something I'm also trying to actively ad advocate, like setting up these domain teams focused on like a specific domain or product. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, have all, all the roles required to go end to end in the same room, essentially. Yeah. I mean, that's hard to, to have everything in place then for yeah. kind of a cross-functional team like that. Yeah. 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 And yeah, then you sense. also need to have good data quality, like Roman said, and yeah. you have to have the, the technical enablers in place as well to also have, uh, well, a platform to deploy your models on and have all this monitoring stuff in place as well, for example. Yeah. 
Cool. Roman, what about you? When, when you come into an organization, what are kind of the, the interesting tidbits you've seen? Yeah, I typically see that um, a lot of uh, technical uh, uh, technical experience is uh, needed. Mm. So uh, it, ML uh, engineering is always dealing uh, with complex setups, uh, with asynchronous um, processes and um, uh, big data and the consistency and the full integration uh, of the pipeline. Yeah. And uh, uh, this requires expertise in, uh, for example, cloud engineering um, and, uh, of course, software engineering in uh, always uh, yeah, data engineering. It's a cross-disciplinary uh, problem. Yeah. And um, usually I see that there is a lack of um, like full picture understanding. So you have a person who understands uh, a model yeah. development really well, and a person who understands the cloud engineering very well, but they don't know how to put this uh, puzzle uh, all together. Mm. And I think th this is where the MLOps also steps in to kind of explain uh, people from different backgrounds, what they need to do to accomplish the common goal. Yeah. And um, because uh, as a consultancy, we're um, uh, planning on different fields from time to time. So sometimes we are more on, on the cloud engineering, some, sometimes more on the um, data science. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we see this problem from different angles. So and uh, my mission uh, frequently looks like uh, first enabling Mm -hmm. uh, like solving the key problems to make the, 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 the process flow and then explain like what was missing and uh, how to uh, continue uh, working in this uh, fashion. Yeah. So for, for me, the most uh, typical use case is to bring the vision and enable a uh, couple of, uh, solve couple of uh, critical uh, technical problems with yeah. that. Yeah. No, that's difficult. I think, I think it's a whole lot that you need currently as, as engineer by itself. Uh, and now even with kind of the ML ops mindset, there's a different aspect that you also need to kind of keep in mind in that way, right? As engineer, you're already working on software. Uh, now with the cloud, there's a different aspect in kind of the operational thing as well. Yeah. Uh, and then you also add on top of that kind of the, the ML ops side. Yeah. It's, it's quite a lot. Well, yes. And um, I agree. But uh, like what we are trying to uh, present as a solution for this complexity yeah. is uh, standardization. Yeah. So, of course, uh, you can bring a lot of tools and try to uh, bind them together, but better select one few to, few tools that actually solve the problem yeah. and uh, just standardize it across the organization. Don't try to bring more and more tools and expect that you will be able to maintain them in the future. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, it's a rabbit hole. It, you, 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 you never end up with the working solution and and i would recommend and uh, what we are actually doing is either uh, go for the managed solutions mm. or minimal uh, setups that that make it work yeah so and then just as a philosophy adopt the solution to to feed the organization and don't try to uh, to do uh, some you know serious engineering to to make everything perfect yeah because the complexity is there it will always uh, uh, hit you when you will try to deliver um, uh, the working solution exactly and yeah uh, start easy just with the mindset that you have to do um, data validation uh, model analysis all these MLOps principles yeah. in place and uh, whatever tool fits the organization with the experience of the engineers in the organization um yeah just just try to feed it um so you don't spend a lot of effort on that and uh, uh, often there is a case uh, we recommend managed solutions as i mentioned yeah um, uh, luckily cloud uh, providers are uh, catching up with the demand yeah. and uh, you can see a lot of uh, good uh, uh, solutions managed solutions in the cloud now yeah yeah i think uh, try to embrace that and uh, <coughs> yeah don't be a hero in this game because uh, <laughs> because it's it definitely it's it's always um under estimated yeah. the complexity especially because you don't see the full picture at the beginning you are underestimating like what will it will end up with and uh, i think again the my mindset of mlops uh, gives you the full picture and you understand what are the key uh, pillars um, of this problem yeah and yeah just uh, try to do mvp um, uh, use um, managed services yeah and, i really uh, like that i really yeah. like kind of the the golden path that you kind of laid out as well i'm hoping that 
for a lot of aspects, that'll kind of cover the the product that you want to build in the first place, right? Yeah. And as you said, you don't want to go and buy every tool off the shelf and, and kind of make it fit, uh, right? You want to have that minimum tool set to actually bring value to your customer in the first place. Then test and iterate and see if you actually need some more tools or you're happy with that and you can just bring value in that way. Cool, man. Thanks a lot, guys. I had a lot of fun. I hope yeah. you had too. Yeah, me too. Yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, it was a Thanks great pleasure. Us. Thank you so much. Awesome, man. Thanks, guys. So on my left, Julian De Ruyter, and on my right, Roman Ivanov. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Cool.